Hello everyone. Welcome back to the course on Learn to Read Architectural and Structural Drawings with ETABS. In this lecture, we'll be trying to see how the footing layout is going to look. We'll try to connect that with the architectural plan and how the structure consultant has worked out the footing location and the size of the footing. Along with that, we'll be trying to see the cross section of this footing and we'll try to understand them one by one. So we'll quickly get into the lecture and try to understand how the footing layout is worked out. So this is how the footing layout is going to look. Yeah, so you can see again the same thing here. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K are the grid lines. Similarly, here instead of making it as A, B, C, D, the structure consultant has worked, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's already A, B, C, D here. And here it has been, the grid line has been 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, <laughs> 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So in this way, the structure consultant has given the grid line. Now coming to the column, all these are my column. You can see the column here, right? See, well, since it is a footing layout, we have to try to understand. What is the name of the footing given here? The name of the footing given is F1. Similarly, what is the name of a footing given here? The name of a footing given here is F2. What is the name of a footing given here? F3. And what is the name of a footing given here? It is also F3. Why? Because the structure consultant might have felt that since the size of this footing, that is 2200 by 2400. Similarly, the size of this footing is 2200 by 2400. Since both the size of the footing is same, he has named it as F3 footing. It's like a naming ceremony. If you find that, like let us say, if you find that both the kids have the same, uh, have the similar uh, uh, behavior, in that case, we, 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 what we do is we try to name them same with the same name, isn't it? In the same way, uh, here, the, since the size is same, uh, that is why what the structure consultant has done is both the name has given F3 here. Whereas here he has given the name F5 because here the size is changing. It is 1800 by uh, uh, 2000. Similarly, we'll come here. Again, this is a F3 footing. <coughs> this F3 footing is similar to this. That is why you have a name here F3. Then we have F7 footing. I mean, we have F7 footing here. Again, a F3. Again, a F5. You know, F3, F2, F1, F3. So, so on. Every, uh, so, so on. They have given the name so F7 and you have a footing number F26 as well. There's F3 footing, there's F2 footing, you know, there's F19 footing, there's F17 footing, F17, F19 and so on. Yeah. So this was all about the footing and how you're going to name them. And everywhere the size is written to the footing. <coughs> Along with that, uh, yeah. Yeah, now coming to the column. So the name of the column which is resting on F1 footing is C1. The name of the column which is resting on F2 is named as C2. The name of a column which is resting on F3 footing is C3. The name of a column which is resting on F3 is C4. Uh, then the name of the column resting on F5 is C5. So all these things depend how we are going to group them and what is the size of the column that is coming. Similarly, each footing has its own name and uh, uh, whatever columns you are going to place over that we have named it as c14 c15 c16 c17 c18 c19 20 you know uh, c21 22 23 24 and then 25 26 and so on this is how you are going to place the for uh, column uh, uh, this is how you are going to name it name the column that is c32 c33 and all yeah now coming to the footing, how this footing are uh, how how this footing are planned? See, this footing are planned based on the architectural plan. Whatever architectural plan I have here, right? So I have a architect. This is my architectural plan. Let us see the ground floor plan layout. So I have a column here, the one which is red in color. I mean, sorry, the one which is uh, black in color. One. I have a second column here. I have a third column here. I have a fourth column here. I have a fifth column here. So wherever I have given a column. Under that, you, have, you need to get a footing. That means I have one, two, three, four, five column here. That is why what I'm trying to get. That is why what I'm getting here in the first layer, I'm getting one footing. This is second footing. This is third footing. This is my fourth footing. And this is my fifth footing. Now going back to that again. Again, I have one column here, second column here, third column here, and fourth column here. Then I have one more column here, one more column here 
one more column here, one more column here, one more column here. So one thing you need to observe here, you don't have a column here, but you have a column here. That is why you can see a footing there, right? You can see it. It's one, two, three and four, but you don't have a footing here. The reason behind that is you don't have a column here. But when you're coming in this region, you have one, two, three, four and five column. That is why you have here one, two, three, four and five footing. So same logic holds good everywhere. We'll not try to do each and everything. I uh, hope it is understood. Now coming to this particular portion, you have a one column here. You have second column, third column, fourth column. And this portion, what you can see here, right? Since it's a kind of cantilever here, you have to give one column here and one column here. So the same thing has been worked out here. You have one, two, three, four column here. This is that cantilever portion where we actually try to, where we actually try to get it into the building. You can see a video at the end of this section where the complete, you know, uh, video has been put up uh, regarding the uh, regarding this G plus two hostel. So this two column, what you can see here, one and two column, and you have a footing here. You have a footing here. So it represents this particular. You, anyhow, they have not shown a column here. They should have shown a column here. There's one column here, the second column here. So under that, you're going to get a footing. That is what we are trying to see here. Other than that, the rest all remains the same. There's no much thing to explain here again. Again, if, if you concentrate here, we have one column, the second column, third column, fourth column, fifth column. So you can see here one, one footing. You can see a second footing here. You can see a third footing here. You can see a fourth footing here. You can see another footing, a five footing. Coming to the circular column, here one circular here, second circular column, third circular column, fourth circular column. So the footing also is, uh, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a kind of square footing, I would say. So one, two, three, four footing un under that. Since you have one, two, three and four column, you have four footing under that. Rest all remains the same. There is no much changes again. And I hope it is understood up to here, right? So these things we'll try to see even on, in one of our lecture, how do you work out, uh, how, how do you work out all this size of the footing? As of now, you can see the footing sizes are very random, right? Like you are 2200, 2450, 2650, right? So we'll try to work, we'll try to see how these uh, footings has to be worked out. Uh, like what all, what all are the load that you need to consider uh, while designing the footing, how the SPC has, be, has to be taken care of. And based on that, we'll try to arrive the size of the footing, right? And uh, other than that, yeah, this is how you have to work out. This is how we try to work out the size of the footing. And this is how the, this is called a footing layout. So based on this, the execution will be done on the side. And as I told you in the beginning of my class, this is the first drawing that we are going to release that is called as footing layout. So that the site engineer will get an idea that he's going to mark the grid lines A and B, C, D, 11 and all. And this from the center point, he's going to mark, uh, if it is 2000 is the overall, you know, uh, size of the footing, then he's going to mark 1000 mm from here and 1000 mm from here. So this is how the execution will be done. Now we'll try to see the uh, depth of the footing. As I mentioned you, you're not going to get the depth of the footing in the footing layout. For that, you have to refer the footing schedule. So we'll try to see how the footing schedule and how the column schedule is, uh, column schedule looks because you can see only the column here, right? C3, C4, C5 is only the name of a column. What is the size of the column? That is not mentioned here. What is the reinforcement that you need to use? Or how many number of longitudinal reinforcement has to be put up? That is not mentioned here. What is the lateral ties that you need to put up? What dimension of the lateral ties you need to put up? Whether it is a two leg, whether, whether it is a four leg, what is the center to center spacing between the lateral ties? And that is not shown here. For that, we need to refer another drawing that is called as footing and a, it, it is called as a footing schedule. And uh, again, it is called as a column schedule. So first thing we need to understand here, what is written? I'll try to zoom in. Yeah. So what is written here? It is written column schedule. And what he's mentioning that you have to make use of M20 grade of concrete and the steel that you have to use is FE500 and the cover for the column is to be 50 mm. Usually 40 mm is a cover what we try to give. Maybe the exposure condition is somewhere from mild to moderate, I would say. That is why the structure consultant has given uh, the, you know, uh, footing as the cover as 50 mm. Or I feel by mistake has written it here because usually what happens is 
um for the footing we give 50 mm cover and for the column we give 40 mm cover maybe uh, there's a you know human error from the draftman uh, that instead of writing uh, 40 or instead of writing this cover 50 mm in here he might have written it here maybe otherwise usually what i feel is uh, the cover for the column is 40 mm and for the footing it is 50 mm since it is a column uh, since it is a footing details is mentioning us looks like this should have this cover of 50 mm should have come here itself under the footing category but uh, he has he has written it in the column category and now it's not an issue usually let us consider the cover for the column is 40 mm and for the footing it is 50 mm right so we'll try to see the footing schedule first then we'll come back to this so these are the footing schedule the structure consultant is telling us that we need to use m20 grid of concrete and the rebar we have to use is fe 500 grid m20 it's understood that um M stand for mix and 20 is the characteristic compressive strength of that particular concrete. Uh, and we know the ratio of a M20 grade. The ratio for M20 grade is 1 is to 1.5 <coughs> is to 3, right? So this, yeah, 1 is to 1.5 is to 3. So this is a grade of a 1 is to 1.5 is to 3. That means for this particular M20 grade to prepare, I need I need to add one part of cement, one and a half part of um, sand, and three parts of coarse aggregate. This is what I need to follow, right? It won't be they won't mention all these things in the drawing because it's understood to the site engineer and to the person who does this job that M20 we need to make use of this grade of concrete and this uh, ratio. Yeah. So coming back. So these are the footing numbers F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6, F7, F8, you know, F9, F9, F11, F15, F16, F17, F19, F20, up to F31. That is the name of a that is the name of a footing. Then coming to the column number, the column C1 and C C10, the column C1 and C10 is resting on F1 footing. What the structure consultant is trying to tell us is that he is telling us that on the footing F1, wherever the footing is marked F1, you have a column C1 and C C10 resting on that. We'll try to see F1 footing. See, this is F1 footing. On this F1 footing, what is the name of a column? That is C1. Similarly, he's telling us that there's one more column C10 resting on F1 footing. Again, we'll try to see another foot uh, column C10. The name of a column should be C10. Yeah, it's here. You can see here, right? The name of the footing is F1, but the column resting on that is C10. Whereas here I have a, another footing, I mean the F1 footing itself, but the column resting here is C1. So maybe C1 and C10 are the two, dim two different dimensions of a column. That is why he has given it in this way. Similarly, he has given F2 footing. On F2 footing, you have C2 and C7 column. Again, the same logic. I have a F2 footing here. On that, the C2 column is resting. And what he's trying to tell convey us, again, he's trying to convey us that on F2 footing, we have a C7 column again on F2 footing. We'll try to see where is another F2 footing or a C7 column. Yeah. So this is another F2 footing here. The name of the column is C11. That is what he is trying to convey us. Yeah, I think he has made a mistake here. This should have been C11 on F2 footing or he might have done a mistake somewhere here. We'll try to figure it out. On F2 column, we have a C2 column and another F2 footing I have here, but this is a C, C11. It is written C11 here. It is written C11 here. I don't find any other F2 column. I mean, F2 footing here. No, not an issue. Maybe this are certain, you know, uh, mistakes what they try to do, but maybe during the execution, uh, we'll get to know all these things and we'll try to rectify it there. But this kind of uh, mistake shouldn't be done uh, because if there is a, some fresher working, then he might uh, you know, make blunders at the side. So these things usually we need to, we need to, you know, uh, bring it to the notice of a structural consultant so that he'll change the drawing and give it back to us. Maybe they might have given some other drawing, but I have this drawing. Maybe they might have changed it, but anyhow, but with the, with the logic, with the thinking and the, with the logic, what we have, we can clearly find that on F2 footing, we have a C11 column resting here, but whereas here the draftman has given C7 column. But C7 column is not resting on F2 footing. So this is how you try to work out everywhere. You see the footing number and see what is column resting on. 
Then the footing type it is a pad footing. Pad footing is nothing but isolated footing. You have a footing and you are resting your column over that. And the size of the footing is it's a rectangular in shape. <clears throat> we'll try to see how that pad footing looks. It's a normal footing, pad footing. Yeah. So these are those pad footing. What is trying to tell us is this is how the footing looks. You have a footing here and you have a column here. So this is how your footing is going to look. So this is called as pad footing. If it is a step footing, it looks like this. We'll not try to get into this. We'll try to see this in some other section. We have a slow footing to look into. But as of now, this is how a pad footing look. You have a footing and you have a column. This is how that pad footing is going to look, right? Yeah, we'll close this. And that is what he's trying to tell us that the footing type is pad footing. It's not a slope footing, nor it is a step footing. So that is what he's trying to tell us. Now coming to the footing dimensions. So he has giving us the length, the breadth of the footing and the depth of the footing. Then let us say this is F1 footing. So for F1 footing, we can even identify it from here itself that the footing size is 2000 by 2200 is F1 footing. The same will be written here. So we have a F1 footing, which is 2050 by 1850. And the depth of that footing is 400 mm. Similarly, we have F2 footing, which is again 2450 by 2220. And uh, D1 is the depth of that footing. Similarly, we have F3 footing, which is 2350 by 2150 into 450 is the depth of the footing. So everywhere, whatever is the size of the footing and depth of the footing, all those things will be mentioned here. And you can see here D2. So this D2 will come into play when you have a stepped footing or you have a slope footing. As of now, all the footing are pad footing. That is why this D2 will not come into picture. If it was D2, then this you can see here, right? So you can see this another step. This is one step. This second step, this, this would have been a D2. This would have been D2. You can see in the slope footing, this will be my D1. And this would have been my D2. Those things will be mentioned if you're going for a slope footing. As of now, we don't have any slope footing. Everything is a pad footing. So you are getting only D1, D1, D1 everywhere. So this is what you're trying. This is what you try to get everywhere. It is D1. Now coming to the reinforcement, since we don't have any combined footing and everywhere you're going to get the bottom reinforcement. You don't have anything in the top reinforcement. So there's nil here. There's nothing written here. Coming to this portion along B and along L, what you can find is for the F1 footing, you need to make use of a 12 diameter bar and that center to center spacing has to be kept at 185 center to center spacing and along the shorter span. We know all these things now, which is the shorter span, which is a longer span. We'll not try to get into that again. Along the longer span, you have to provide another 12 diameter bar at 205 center to center spacing, right? Let me do it. See, this is a footing what I have. This is a footing what I have and uh, it, let me draw it. Let me draw a different thing. Yeah. So this is a footing what I have. So th let us consider. This is my shorter span, uh, which is a shorter span here. B is a shorter span. This is 1850. And this is my longer direction, which is two zero five zero. And uh, yeah, so the first reinforcement what you have to provide is a 12 diameter bar at 185 center to center spacing along B. Along B is this. This is my B. That is my 1850. Along this direction, this will my this will be the reinforcement that I'm going to place. This is a kind of a reinforcement that I'm going to place. And this center to center direction has to be how much 185 it has to be 185 and I have to make use of which diameter bar 12 diameter bar similarly along the Y. So this is my Y direction 2050 is coming under length portion. So this is my Y direction. So I'm going to place a bar along the Y direction. This is a bar which I'm going to place in Y direction. These are my longer span bar. These are my Y direction bar. These are my Y direction bar and uh, you know uh, this center to center spacing what is trying you have to make use of 12 diameter bar. That is good. But the center to center spacing is 205. So it has to be 205. This center to center, this center to center, this center to center, this center to center. These dimensions has to be 205. This has to be, this has, this has to be 205, right? 
So the same logic holds good for all the footing. We have already seen this, how to place the footing reinforcement in one of our previous section. It's very simple to understand. If you are still not able to understand this, you can watch, uh, watch out my one of my course where I've explained all these things in a more animated way with the help of videos, with the help of, you know, site images and also uh, in a more animated way, I try to explain each and everything in more detail. I don't want to spend my time here again. So that will make you more boring. So this is how you have to work out. Uh, if you're putting the reinforcement. So whatever I explained here, the same logic holds good everywhere along the shorter, the shorter bar will come first. The, the bar which is in the shorter the, along the B, this is all my shorter span and all this my longer span. So a shorter bar will be placed first followed by the longer bar. The reason behind that is the low transfer will happen along the shortest possible path. So the shortest possible path is a shorter span. That is why the main reinforcement is provided parallel to the shorter span and the distribution bar is provided along the y direction that is along the l direction right so this is the logic behind uh, this footing so this is how we need to understand it's the same thing everywhere the length breadth and depth is given you have to just look at the what reinforcement is given based on that we have to work out this now we'll come to that important uh, portion where the uh, section is given before that if you are not able to understand this is how it is given see this is my length. Okay. This is my length and this is my breadth. This is my breadth. So B is a shorter span. Again, if you want to see that you can see it. What is given here? See, you can see B out of this dimension 2050 and 1850, which is smaller. 1850 is smaller. 2450 and 2250, which is smaller. 2250 is smaller. So whatever dimensions they have given in the under the breadth, they all are smaller dimension in comparison to the dimension that is given under L column, right? So that is why whatever is written here, this dimension bar, the bar will be placed parallel to this dimension. That is why in the cross section, you'll try to uh, give everything. So this is my B, it is B written here, and this is L written here. So the bar which you are going to place in this direction, there will be first bar. That is why they have shown it here. This is the bar what you are what you have to give. That is B. B is what they have given. Similarly, the bar what you are going to place here, that is along the Y direction. This is how you are going to place. So you can see the this bar has been drawn first, followed by this bar. You can see this bar, right? This bar is drawn first. And over that, you can see this bar. Not that this bar is drawn first and this bar is coming over that. If you observe it carefully, this this draw this line has been drawn first. Since it is a shorter span, it 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 conveys us that this bar has to be placed first at the side. Then this bar has been put up over that with help, I mean on the AutoCAD. So this, this will come over that, that is a distribution bar. This N into B, the, the symbol N represents number of bar that you have to put up, but that comes handy when you take out, when you do the bar bending schedule. When you, uh, in the bar bending schedule, what we try to do is for this entire length, how many number of such bars are coming, that will try to count. But as of now, we'll not try to get into the bar bending schedule. Okay, so that will come handy. N into B is number of bar into B you have to do. That is going to give a total number of bar that is going to come along this particular direction, along this particular direction. Similarly, we're coming to the cross section part now. This is how the cross section is going to look. So this cross section is a bit interesting to see. The thing is that you have a GL here. This is my ground level. And from here, I'm going down. From here, I'm going to going down. So in this case, they are not given what is the depth of your excavation. Yeah. So here they are not given the depth of excavation. Uh, maybe from the existing level itself, you have to do the ex excavation up to five feet, up to up to five feet, you have to do excavation. But especially this particular project where it is happening, there is a lot of, you know, uh, loose soil. So directly you cannot do the excavation, do the compaction, lay the PCC and finish your work. That is not going to happen. That is why uh, I feel what uh, that is why uh, what the structure consultant has given is you can see here, right? See when when this condition arises, let us say you are given a five feet excavation, and even after excavating up to five feet, you are not getting any hard soil, and still if you start to do the excavation, uh, you don't know whether you are going to get a hard soil or not. In that case, what we try to do, we want to make a very hard surface, and this hard surface can be done by adopting this method. What we are doing here, actually, you know. You look here, what is written here? Well compacted Muram soil with lime plus brick bed. See, Muram soil is a loose soil. Uh, it cannot, uh, it doesn't have enough safe bearing capacity. It doesn't have enough bearing capacity. So the structure consultant has given, is telling that 
whatever murum soil you are getting there below the 5 feet or let us say 6 feet you have to compact it that is why it is written well compacted murum soil with lime so why he is using a term called lime because lime is used as the uh, what you call that uh, stabilization i mean if you are having some weak soil and all if you are adding lime to that due to the reaction of the lime with that soil the bearing capacity of the soil is going to increase that is why he is mentioning us that you have to use a well compacted murum soil you have to always compact that soil along with the lime you add lime into that so there are certain procedure to add those things even i don't have much idea how those things are done but usually what we try to do is we add lime to the soil so that it it is called as soil stabilization you can try to google out and understand how those things are done and as a result of that the bearing capacity of the soil is going to increase you are going to do the compact along with that you are going to add brick beds so brick beds are the broken 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 uh, bricks you are going to put brick beds and you are going to add lime and lime into the murum soil you are going to mix it and you are going to do the compaction as a result of that what is going to happen the density of a soil is going to increase i mean the safe bearing capacity of a soil is going to increase and due to the brick bed you are going to get a thick uh, soil over there so that it it becomes a kind of hard soil over that he is telling us one more thing to do 300 mm thick rubber soling so what is this 300 mm thick rubber so rubber uh, rubber soling we'll try to see that how it looks practically yeah uh, you can see this right so these are those 300 these are big boulders so when you add this boulders uh, you are going you are going to get a very hard soil strata this is how they try to do see this is called a soling uh, here there is a lot of loose soil here so they have done an excavation and you know these are the big big boulders what you get they have kept the big boulders here this is how they arrange the big boulders this is called as soling and uh, uh, since uh, even even if we encounter black cotton soil black cotton soil is a very weak soil uh, even when you encounter black cotton soil this is a kind of method what you try to do because since you cannot directly put pcc and allow your footing to rest there we have to do you know a lot of soil uh, stabilization kind of thing in that case what we do is we we do this kind of method that is you put big boulders there so that even the soil is weak these boulders will make give a hard soil strata and it can transfer the load coming on that footing uh, uniformly to the soil right so that is the idea behind that so you can see here the uh, made use of the boulders here these are the big boulders uh, big uh, stones what you can get so and over that these are the brick brick beds what you can see the broken stones are called as brick beds you can see this right so all these are the brick beds they are the broken stone um this is how we actually try to do once that is done we are going to lay the pcc over that you can see this is a pcc of m7.5 or m10 grade so what what will happen as a result of that and over that your footing is going to come so when once you do this it will become it it, it will it will be a very hard soil i mean it will become a very uh, you know thick thing so that whatever load is coming on that this particular area will transfer it safely over the soil so that your soil can take that much amount of load so this is a uh, kind of you know techniques that we try to adopt when we encounter loose soils or let us say black cotton soil or a murum soil right yeah uh, so going back to that yeah so that is why you can see this kind of things was this kind of things have been given by the structure consultant but if you try to concentrate uh, in one of our, in a, in a previous section when we were learning g plus uh, 3 residential building uh, there you didn't have all this kind of uh, you know uh, sections because maybe the soil over there was very good so you had to do a excavation up to 5 feet put a pcc and start your footing work you didn't have to do all this uh, you know a, a kind of circles but here since the soil itself is loose we have to do all these things so that is why you can see <clears throat> a well compacted murum soil with lime plus brick beds is given and over that you have to put a you know yeah over the, i mean that is that is a th uh, that is called as 300 mm thick rubber soling uh, yeah yeah one point i want to add here 300 mm thick rubber soling what is trying to tell is so 300 mm comes out to be this much so this much thick amount of you have to do a well compacted soil the murum soil has to be well compacted with a brick beds and you have to put that big boulders it has to be well compacted that entire thickness should come out to be 300 mm that is what he is trying to teach uh, tell us here let me make it even i didn't notice that yeah what is trying to tell us is this 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 thing what you can see here you know this thing this much portion what you can see this much portion what you can see this is a 300 mm thick 
rubber soling so that has to be a well compacted murum soil with lime with lime we are mixing the soil with for the soil we are mixing the lime and we are going to add brick bats over that and over that we are going to put the big boulder sand all and we are going to compact it very good so that you are going to get a 300 mm thick and over that we are going to add another 150 mm thick well compacted sand layer over that you are going to put another 150 mm thick sand the normal fine aggregate what we get the sand we what we call that you have to put another 150 mm over that and it has to be well compacted with the help of that uh, earth rammer or you can make use of monkey rammer or a plate compactor and over that we are going to put the 100 mm thick pcc so pcc stand for plain cement concrete right and the ratio has not been mentioned here but usually we try to go with m7.5 or m10 grade of pcc so this is a general uh, th uh, general grade of pcc that we try to use so uh, around 100 mm of pcc has to be put and over that i'm going to put my footing what footing is that these things whatever you can see here uh, yeah whatever whatever things you can see here whatever is the size of the footing given here that is 2050 by 1850 that footing is going to come over this that footing is going to come over this right this is how that footing the dips the addition for the depth of the footing uh, these are your footing reinforcement the uh, shorter span bar and the one you can see in the dotted one dotted one what you can see they are your distribution bar and this is your column reinforcement and this is your column reinforcement and these are your column lateral ties we'll try to see how how to understand the column lateral ties right so yeah we'll delete this yeah, you got an idea, right? So in this case, in this particular uh, project, you cannot directly put a PCC. You have to put a 300 mm thick soling. You have to do a lime stabilization. Along with that, you have to put, uh, you know, brick bats and it has to be a, a big boulders. And over that, I have to put another 150 mm of well compacted sand layer. And over that, I'm going to put 100 mm, 100 mm thick PCC. And over that, my footing is going to come. So this is how it is given now and these are the lateral ties to be continued till the base of the column this is usually what we try to do these are the lateral ties of the column that will go from here up that will go till the bottom till this level it's going to go that is fine we already seen that now coming to the column thing right so far what we discussed was only about the footing now coming to the column uh, we'll take another one or two minutes so we can uh, it's we are done with this so again what he has given here so the column C1, C2, C3, C6, C10, C11, C32, and C33. All these are the same size of a column. And the size of the column is 230 mm, that is 9 inch. And 450 mm comes out to be, uh, 4 and a half, uh, 450 mm comes out to be 18 inches. Yeah, it is 18. So it is a 9 inch by 18 inch column. Uh, that is 230 mm by 450. And these are the number of uh, longitudinal reinforcement. 1, 2, 3 four five six seven eight these are the number of longitudinal reinforcement that we need to use so he has mentioned here you have to make use of 16 diameter how many number of bars that is not mentioned here but by just looking at the figure you have one dot here two three four five six seven eight so to make use of eight number of 16 diameter bar in this column of 230 mm by 450 mm it's mentioned here you have to make use of eight mm bar a 16 diameter bar of how many numbers of eight numbers fine and this all the column which name which reads c1 c2 c3 c6 c10 c11 c32 and c33 they all have the same size and this is the reinforcement that you need to put that is c1 column what i have and then c2 c3 c6 c1 column the column what i have here on f1 footing c1 the column what i have here c2 the column what i have here c3 all these columns should be 230 mm by 450 mm and it should have 16 diameter air 8 bar that is a longitudinal reinforcement and uh, the what is the links the links are the lateral ties what we saw that right these are the lateral ties what is the lateral ties that you need to provide you need to make use of 8 mm bar and the center to center spacing has to be 200 mm center to center spacing right the center to center spacing you know that already what do you mean by center to center spacing and now I'll try to tell it here if you're not able to follow it this spacing what is trying to convey us this center to center spacing what you can see here right so this center to center spacing has to be 200 mm this center to center spacing has to be 
200 mm this center to center spacing has to be 200 mm throughout so everywhere it has to be 200 mm 200 mm 200 mm and the lateral test what i'm using it has to be a 8 mm it should be made up of 8 mm bar and uh, going back again Huh. So 200 mm and these are the two lateral ties we need to use. This is my master ring and this will come in the center. What you can see here, you can see here, right? I'll try to zoom in. You can see it here, right? See, one is this full ring which is going. This is a hook what we have. And then this second one what you can see here, right? It is given here from here to here. This is how it is given. Similarly, this is another column. Similarly, this is another column which is C4 column. Uh, the name of the size of the column is again same. It is 230 mm by 450 mm. But whereas here you have to make use of a 16 diameter bar and only six number of bar is given. See, even this column, what you have six C1, C2, C3, C6, C10, even they are, they are also 230 mm by 450 mm. The C4 column is also 230 mm by 450 mm. Then why not this column was added here itself? The reason was that in all this column, you, you need 16 diameter bar of eight number. Whereas in this particular column, you actually require 16 diameter of six number of bar. Since there was change in the longitudinal bar, the structure consultant has given a separate column to this. But instead of doing this for a separate column, even if you had given, uh, even if you had put this C4 column under this, then nothing would have happened. But this structure consultant is trying to be more economical. So that is why he has given a separate column to C4. Yeah, he has given a separate name to the C4 column and tried to convey us that you have to make use of a 16 diameter 6 bar here. That is why we can see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That is why it's written T of 16. Again, T stands for tall. What is the links that you are going to provide? You have to make use of a 8 mm bar and the center to center is 200. And this is the links that you need to provide. One, you have to uh, completely tie all the uh, longitudinal bar. And then these two bar are left out. You have to make use of this hook. And we know the reason behind this, when this hook has to be used, we already told you that if the center to center distance between these two bar, if the center to center distance between these two bar, if it is greater than 75 mm, if it is greater than 75 mm, if I'm not wrong, that is the, that is what the clause says, then we have to give this kind of hooks. If this center to center distance was less than 75 mm, let me clear this. If this center to center, if this bar and this bar distance was, let us say, less than 75 mm, less than 75 mm, then you need not, need not have provided this particular link. Uh, all these things are given in SP34. SP34, you can refer that uh, for the column detailing. These things have been given. Based on that, we try to work out all these things. We already explained you this in one of my previous section. You can refer there. The entire thing has been explained there. Now, again, coming back to this column, again, it's the same thing. We'll not try to waste much time here. Again, we have another column here. This is interesting. We have the column C4, C12, and C28. So again, the size remains the same. That is 230 by 450. But look at the re reinforcement. You have to provide a 20 diameter 4 bar. Along with that, you have to provide another 16 diameter 2 bar. And how he has uh, given it? See, if you have a dark circle, then that if you have a dark circle, <laughs> then it has to be a 16 diameter bar and if it is a not a dark circle then it is a 20 diameter bar what i'm trying to tell you is that one two three four bar what you have it is not dark in color so these are your 20 diameter bar this this bar this bar this bar and this bar is your 20 diameter bar and the 16 diameter bar what you have is a dark color here right so this is uh, one dark and this is two dark that is why you can see two number here that is why you can see 2 of 16 die written here. You have 1, 2, 3, 4, not dark in color. You have 4 number. That is why you can see a 20 diameter 4 bar mentioned here. Right? So that is why this is com coming under C5, C12 and C28 column. Now coming to the links, the links remains the same. We'll not try to waste time. Again, this is a, another column. Here what has happened? C7, C15, C16, C27. You have to make use of 20 diameter 4 bar and also 16 diameter 4 bar. Whereas here it was 16 diameter 2 bar, but it has increased to another 2 bar. So it's a 16 diameter 4 and 20 diameter 4. And this is how we need to provide, right? So yeah. So other than that, the rest all remains the same. And coming to this bar, again, it's the same thing. You have to provide a 12 diameter 6 bar here. 
and this is how you need to provide these are the links what you need to provide now coming to the circular column we'll try to take one circular column remember the circular column is coming in which position it's coming in the circular i mean uh, it's coming in the middle of that building what we saw so this is your circular column so c17 c18 c21 and c22 are my circular column you have to make use of a 12 diameter bar of 16 number and the links has to be made up of 8 mm bar at 150 center to center spacing and i always mentioned you that if you are putting up a circular column the minimum longitudinal reinforcement that we need to put is minimum six longitudinal reinforcement has to come that is why i feel uh, this uh, consultant has given six uh, 12 diameter six number of i mean that is a minimum thing if it is coming more than that you can provide more than that but minimum even if even by doing calculation if you're getting four number of bar we cannot provide that because the code says that minimum six number of bar has to has to be provided in a circular column so that is why if you see any of a circular column you're going to get minimum six number of longitudinal reinforcement in a circular column right so this is how it is to be understood now coming to the last column which is a bit uh, yeah it's again the same thing the name of the column is c26 yeah the size remains the same yeah the size is changed here now the size is from 230 to 500 mm so this is the size of the column maybe more load is coming on this column that is the reason you have this 230 mm by 500 mm so you have to make use of a 20 diameter 8 number of bar and 20 diameter is indicated by this uh, hollow like you can see 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 and followed by you have to provide another 16 diameter 2 bar and that 16 diameter is denoted by dark circle right so that is why you can see one dark here and the second dark circle here and this is how you have to provide now coming to the links in this case you need to make use of three rings this is your master ring the bigger ring is always a master ring so this ring will be connected throughout the column throughout all the longitudinal uh, bar then the one which is in the, this portion ring will be connected in this way it will be connected here right let me draw it see this is how you have to provide this is my first master ring this master ring will go completely okay then i'll make use of a different color to show you the second ring then my second ring this ring what i have this will be connected in this way this is my second ring right yeah and then this hook what i can see i'll make use of a different color for the hook yeah i'll take a red color so he hook what i can see this is how i am giving my hook so this is how you have to understand the drawing and this is how the drawings are given practically and this is how we need to do a careful uh, study of the drawing before doing any execution of the project other than that i don't feel there is any other thing to explain here almost all things have been covered here yeah so almost all the column schedule and all everything is covered here uh, yeah and how this number of reinforcement is going to come how this lateral ties have worked out all those things we'll try to see with the help of a ETAP software and we'll try to see with the help of excel sheet as well so that we'll get a clear idea how we have to work out all these drawings yeah uh, we'll see you back in the next lecture thank you hello everyone uh, welcome back to the course on learn to read architectural and structural drawings with ETAPs in this lecture we'll try to understand how the plinth beam framing is done how the plinth beam layout is going to look for this G plus two hostel building. And we'll also try to see how the reinforcement has been worked out, right? So we'll quickly get into that and we'll try to understand them. So uh, this is what we have seen so far, right? Uh, what we saw is that we had seen a ground floor plan and we saw a first floor plan. Now we'll try to see how the plinth beam is going to look. So this is how the plinth beam layout is given. You can see it here, it's written here plinth beam layout so we'll try to see how these things have been worked out how to work out the plinth beam layout now what has happened here wherever there is a column you have the one which is dark in color right so all these are the columns there is column everywhere right you have a column here you have a column you have a column 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 and you have a column everywhere these were my circular columns if you remember right and all this was my corridor portion this was my corridor this was my corridor right and this was my toilet portion and i had a kitchen here i had a, you know uh, uh wash area uh dish dishwash area i had a storeroom here isn't it uh, i had a room here then i had a warden room here i had a you know a small passage here uh, i had a you know uh, this was the entrance lobby 
I had a room here and this was my staircase position, right? So how do you frame out all these things that how, where the beam has to come? For that, we need to refer the same uh, ground plan. What we, for this, we need to refer the same plan. What is mentioned here? Yeah, I'll zoom in. Yeah. So what is written here? See, I have a column here. I have a column here. I have a column, I have a column and I have a column here. So wherever there is a column, we have to put it, we have to tie it with the beam. We already seen what is the importance of providing a plinth beam. Plinth beam is provided to carry the mass entry wall load coming on it and also to reduce the height of the column. If you don't put a plinth beam, the, un, the uh, unrestrained height of a column will increase. That will turn, that will make the column as a long column. In order to make the column as a short column, I'm going to insert a beam and that beam is called a plinth beam. Right. So that is why wherever I have a column, I have to tie it with the help of a beam. So I have a column here. I have a column here. I have a column here, column here, column here. So my basic idea will be now to tie this with a beam, right? If I have to tie this with the beam, I have to provide a plinth beam in this way, right? Along with that, I have a column here and I have a column here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to put a beam here. Is I'm teaching how you to how to frame this, how to uh, put a plinth beam, how to do a plinth beam framing. Again, I have a column here. I have a column here. I'll put a plinth beam here. I have a column here. I have a column here. I have a column here. So I'm going to put a one more plinth beam here. Right now, this is a kind of partition what I have. Right, I have a wall coming here. I have a wall coming here. Since there's a wall coming here, I need to put a plinth beam here and also. I feel I need to put a beam here since I have a, a brickwork over this, right? Right. Along with that, wherever there is a column, uh, this is a general uh, plinth beam layout. What we try to do, uh, we'll try to see whether uh, this thing matches with what the uh, structure consultant has, uh, consultant has given it. Okay. So wherever I'm putting a dark uh, color, you know, everywhere the plinth beam is going to come. So here also I require a plinth beam. Here also I require a plinth beam. When he were here, I require a plinth beam. Wherever there is a column, put a plinth beam there so that it will make it as a short column and it will tie the column in all the direction. I have a circular column here. I need a plinth beam here. I need a plinth beam here. I need a plinth beam here. I have a column here. I have to need, I need a plinth beam here. I need a plinth beam here. I have a wall here. So I need a plinth beam here because if I don't provide a plinth beam, the wall, what I'm going to construct, that load cannot be taken by the soil. You cannot expect the soil to take that load. That is why we try to put a plinth beam. So even though I construct a brickwork or a block work over that, that load will be taken by the beam, which is underneath it. That is where, that is why everywhere I put a, a plinth beam. Again, you have a plinth beam in this direction, right? Again, you can get, a, again, you'll have a plinth beam here. So this is how I do a framing of a plinth beam. Now we'll try to see whether the structure consultant has done the same thing or not. Going back to that. I'll try to erase this. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, we'll not erase it. We'll try to see here in the same. Yeah. We'll try to see that what this guy has done. Yeah. So he has done the same thing, whatever I, whatever I, yeah, one, there is a small mistake. What we have done that is fine. I'll try to erase it. Yeah. What they have done is they have put a plinth beam here because there are four columns here. There's a plinth beam here and there's a column here. There's a plinth beam here. You require a plinth beam even here. You require a plinth beam even here. And you require a plinth beam here and you require a plinth beam here. You require a plinth beam here. You require a plinth beam here. You require a plinth beam here, plinth beam here and plinth beam here. What I did is I added two plinth beam here, but that is no more required since this column, uh, uh, this column will be tied with the help of this two plinth beam. There's no need of putting a plinth beam. If required, you could have put a plinth beam here. One plinth beam you could have given here, but that is all right. Not an issue with that. As long as uh, your beams don't fail, as long as your beams uh, don't fail in the ETAPS model, uh, it is fine to do, not an issue. Since it is a partition wall, what you're going to put, it's a partition wall of a toilet, isn't it? So it's not a huge load coming. Maybe that is the reason why the structure consultant has not given a plinth beam here. Again, I'm giving a plinth beam in this direction. I have put a plinth beam here. There's another plinth beam here. And uh, there's a plinth beam here, 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 and here. Uh, there's a plinth beam going throughout. There's a plinth beam here. There's a plinth beam here. There's a plinth beam here, here, here. And this four circular column, what have that has been tied with a plinth beam. I have a plinth beam here. I have a beam here. 
So everywhere, they, wherever there's a column, the column has to be tied in at least two direction. Now, if I consider this column, it has been tied with the plinth beam in this direction, and it has been tied with the plinth beam in this direction. If I consider this column, it has been tied in this direction, and it has been tied in this direction. If I consider this uh, column, it has been tied in this direction, it has been tied in this direction, it has been tied in this direction, as well as it has been tied in this direction. And look at this plinth, look at this column. It has been tied in this direction, in this direction, and it's in this direction. So at least uh, a column should be tied in two direction, at least with the help of a plinth beam. If you consider this uh, column, it is tied in this direction, it is tied in this direction, tied in this direction, tied in this direction. So wherever you go, so since it is tied in two direction, I, that is the reason I think has not given a beam connecting here and a beam connecting here because already this circular column is you know, uh, connected with the help of this plinth beam here and here. So there's no point in giving another plinth beam here and another plinth beam here. Whereas here, what they they felt like they need to add one more beam. That is why you can see this column connected with this beam, this beam and this beam. So you have a plinth beam here. You have a uh, column here. It has been tied here. It has been tied here. It has been tied here. So, right? so this is how we do the framing of a plinth beam. That is why it is written here pin, plinth beam layout. And um, this is how the framing of a plinth beam has to be done. So I'm not showing you any images of a plinth beam and all. By this time, you might have developed that knowledge of how the plinth beam is going to look, how we have to do that. Our concern is only to understand how the framing has to be done, how the plinth beam framing has to be done. Right? Yeah. So that's it. So this is how a plinth beam layout is going to look. Next, we'll try to see the beam details. So what we need to understand here. So the name given here is B1. This beam, what I can see here, right? So it is written B1 here. Now this structure consultant has not made use of a word called P here. In our previous uh, section, in the first drawing of a residential building, we saw a structure consultant giving the name PB1, right? PB2, right? PB3, right? PB4, isn't it? Uh, then uh, we saw him giving the name PB5 and all, right? PB5, P stand for plinth, B stand for beam. But this uh, structure consultant, uh, maybe since it is a small building, I would say, uh, he has not bothered too much to name it as plinth beam and all. What he has done is he has just given the name B1, B2, B3, B4, you know, uh, B5, B6 and so on. That is fine. Not an issue with that. Yeah. So now we'll try to get into the beam details. Now try, look, concentrate here. Yeah. So the name here, it is B1. So this beam, what I can see, it is B1. This beam, what I can see from this column to this column, it is B2. This beam, what I can see between these two columns is B3. This beam, what I can see in between these two columns is B4. So we'll try to see how the reinforcement has been worked out for this beam. So it's B1, B2, B3, and B4. So we'll go back to that. So it is written here, uh, plinth beam details. This is the reinforcement details for the plinth beam. Uh, yeah. Right. So this is how it's going to look B1, B2, B3 and B4. So the grid is A, C, E, <coughs> H and J. The same can be seen in here. Okay. They are not put a grid here. Not an issue. But look at the beam B1, B2, B3 and B4. So entire is coming under a single beam. This entire it's a continuous beam. It's a continuous beam. That is why you can see here. You can see here. Uh, P, B1, B2, B3, B4. Only this much thing we are concentrating. Just look here. We are just concentrating only on this much part. Okay. We are just concentrating only on this much part. I'll try to zoom in this. Yeah, so this will give you a good picture. Yeah, just concentrate. So B1, look at the uh, beam dimensions. B1 is 230 by 300. B2 is 230 by 300. B3 is 230 by 300, 380, sorry. And B4 is also 230 by 380. Uh, so one thing we need to understand, let me make use of the calculator. 380 divided by... 25, 15.2, right. So you can see here what now this time the dimensions has been given in the mm, right? The dimension has been given in mm. But if you try to relate this with the earlier uh, 
drawing what we saw there all the beams were like 9 inch by 15 inch 9 inch by 18 inches right 9 inch by 12 inches but here since it has been converted to mm you can see that it is 230 by 380 230 by 380 230 by 380 280 by 380 so try to convert this and try to understand in terms of feet and inches so that we get an idea so what i'm trying to do is see basically one inch comes out to be 25.4 mm one inch i'll write it here one inch is equal to 25.4 mm right keeping this in mind we'll try to work out how much this is 230 mm coming out so what i do is yeah so what i do is 230 divided by 25.4 so it comes out to be 9.05. Let us consider it has to be 9, 9, 9 inch itself. So this 230 mm in the sense, it is a 9 inch. So it comes out to be 9 inch into, what is this? 380, right? So 380, if I'm dividing it by 25.4, it comes out to be 14.9, 14.96. Uh, 14 Let us consider this has to be 15 inch. What I'm trying to tell here is, even though it is written in mm has 230 by 380, uh, if you want to understand this, in terms of inches feet and inches so it is actually a nine inch actually it is nine inch by uh, 15 inch beam everywhere it is a nine inch by 15 inch beam now try to understand this with practical point of view since it was a g plus two a g plus two residential building the previous uh, uh, section what we saw even there we found the beam dimensions to be 9 inch by 15 inch 9 inch by 18 inch and here also we try we are, we are getting the same dimension of the beam and one thing we need to understand you look at the dimension of the breadth look at the dimension of the breadth it is 9 inch here 9 inch here so in one of my lecture i told you that we never try to change the breadth of the beam because 9 inch is a standard breadth what we try to use either 9 inch or sometimes we make use 1 feet but most of the case what we do is 9 inch itself 9 inches comes out to be 230 mm and that is the size of a brick what you usually get in the market the size of the brick what you get is actually 230 mm that is why uh, I don't want any offset in my room that is the reason I don't keep the width of my beam more than 230 mm that is the reason you can see in all the beams the width has been uh, you know, stop to 230, 230 and 230, right? So this is uh, this thing we need to understand. Yeah, I hope it is understood. Next, we'll go back to this. Yeah, so what is mentioned here? So this is a inner to inner dimension. It is 5000 mm from A grid. Again, these are the grid lines A, C, E, H and G are the grid lines. So the distance between uh, A and C grid, uh, grid line is 5000 mm. C and D, C and D it is 3.447 or 3447 mm e to h it is 3448 mm h to j it is 2935 mm and the thickness of this um, wall the thickness of this column it is mentioned here as 230 mm 230 mm 230 mm 230 mm and 230 mm right now we'll try to understand how the reinforcement is worked out you can see here 3 T of 12 they have written. Again, T stands for TOR or it can be a TMT bar. 12 stands for the diameter of the bar. So you need to make use of a 12 mm bar and this 12 mm bar of 3 number has to go throughout. So that means since it is a continuous beam, what will happen? Let me draw it. What will happen? I am going to provide 3 bars. This is my 1 bar. Okay, I will draw it 3 bar here itself so that you try to uh, you know understand this. What do you mean by 3 bar? Three bar in the sense one bar this is my second bar and this is my third bar so this three bar will go continuously from this column to this column the entire b1 b2 b3 b4 b4 or in all the four beams this 12 diameter three bar will go continuously similarly come to the bottom portion now bottom what is mentioned here again you have to provide 12 diameter three bar t stands for tor or it can be a tmt bar again you need to provide a 12 mm bar of three numbers so how long it will go again this you can see here it is mentioned throughout so it is a throughout you can see one line here right let me make use of a pointer see you can see this bar the one which is here you can see the bottom bar which has gone in this way you can see this bar right yeah so this is a 12 diameter 3 bar in the bottom it's written in the bottom so what i tried what i'll do again what i'm going to do again i'm going to make use of a uh you know uh 12 diameter 3 bar in the bottom even in the bottom what i will do i'll provide 
12 diameter three bar in the bottom layer as well right so this is how i do the framing along with that now we need to understand how the stirrups have been given right we need to understand how the stirrups have been given so what is written here what is written here two legged 2l stand for two leg stirrup t of 8 means again you have to make use of 8 mm bar now try to connect this with the previous example what we do there also we made use of uh, 8 mm bar and it was a two leg stirrup and also i told you that in most of the cases the stirrup diameter what we try to use is 8 mm itself that is why you can see here it's a two leg at 8 mm and look at the center to center spacing this time the center to center spacing is 130 mm and here the center to center spacing is 130 mm here also it is 130 mm here also it is 130 mm that means what is trying to tell the stirrups what you are going to provide i'll provide a stirrup here i'll provide stirrup here so this is how your beam is going to look finally once it is done yeah so these are my stirrup what i'm trying to put i'm drawing it randomly here so these are the stirrup what i'm putting so this the distance between this center to center distance between all this stirrup is how much 130 mm so it is a 130 mm the center to center distance between all these stirrup is 130 mm but 130 mm they shouldn't have given it because the people working in the site they understand in terms of feet and inches so 130 comes out to be uh, 5 inches comes out to be 125 mm so how can a carpet how can a barbender understand this as 130 mm so what he does is he is going to give a 5 inch only because 1 inch is 25.4 mm uh, i think it will work out let me yeah so it, it comes it, it's a 5 inch itself yeah I, i'm sorry for that i made a mistake here what i'm trying to tell is yeah what i'm trying to tell is we'll make use of calculator see uh, 1 inch is uh, 1 inch is 25.4 1 inch is 25.4 mm so if i divide 130 divide by 25.4 mm it has to be 5 inch exactly it is 5 inch so the carpenter even though i am writing here has uh, even though i am writing it in terms of mm the barbender at the side will understand in terms of feet and inches so he's going to space this 5 inches center to center spacing 5 inches center to center spacing 5 inches center to center spacing so 5 inches means it's one it's almost a 130 mm so that is why what i'm trying to tell is what i'll do yeah we'll make use of text so this center to center spacing is 130 uh, center to center spacing this spacing what you can see here right yeah this spacing what i can what you can see here right this spacing what you can see center to center spacing is 130 center to center 130 center to center 130 center to center it is mentioned here that is the reason we are providing everywhere 130 center to center 130 center to center 130 130 comes out to be 5 inches so this is how we try to do and this is how we have to understand the reinforcement i'll discard it and we'll try to see some other drawing uh, where we may we may get some additional reinforcement yeah yeah this one this one seems to be interesting we'll try to see this now 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 coming to this again <laughs> it is a b14 b15 and b16 beam this is my d grid line g grid line i grid line uh, j, uh, j grid line and uh, you know uh, this uh, distance is 3305 1420 2630 and this thickness is 230 mm this thickness is 230 mm and this thickness what you have is 450 mm and this brickwork uh, i mean this this uh, this what you have here it is a 450 mm so what is written here what about the reinforcement it is written you have to provide 12 diameter 3 bar at the top and also a 12 diameter 3 bar at the top so here throughout the span you are going to provide 12 diameter 3 number of bar and also coming to the bottom portion you are going to provide 12 diameter 3 bar here and also here you are going to provide 12 diameter 3 bar so even in the bottom portion i'm going to provide 12 diameter 1 2 and 3 bar that is good now coming to the stirrup now look at the stirrup here here again you have to make use of two leg stirrup which should be made up of 8 mm but look at the center to center spacing it has come to 285 inches i'm sorry 285 mm center to center spacing here but whereas here what has happened again you have to make use of two leg at 8 mm of 8 mm but that center to center spacing has to be 130 mm throughout the span here it has to be 285 but here in this particular span 
that is G and I grid in between this in the in this beam of B15 you have to make use of stirrup of two leg of 8 mm and the center to center spacing has to be 130 center to center spacing. Now coming to this particular beam this is more interesting. Now what has happened here in this particular beam what is trying to tell you have to provide 12 diameter 3 bar at the top and 12 diameter 3 bar at the bottom that is good. But coming to the stirrup, you can see here what he has written. Here you have to provide two-legged 8 mm stirrup. Again, here also you have to provide two-legged 8 mm stirrup. Again, here, here, out here, again, again, here, you have to provide two-legged 8 mm stirrup. But look at the spacing what is giving. From here to this support, he is telling that you have to provide it at 130 center to center spacing. And from this face of the support to this distance, what he has shown here, this arrow mark, I mean, this uh, line, what he has drawn, it has to be 130 center to center spacing. And this distance he has already given, the structural consultant has given from the face to 880 mm, I have to provide my stirrup at 130 center to center spacing. From this face to 880 mm, I have to provide my stirrup at 130 center to center spacing. And whatever is left in between, and whatever is left in between, I have to provide two-legged 8 mm bar itself but there I'm instead of providing at 130 I have to increase my spacing to 285 center to center spacing 285 center to center spacing what is trying to tell is we'll try to understand this with the help of a drawing here so this is the stirrup what I'm trying to draw okay so I'm trying to draw it very closely I'm trying to draw it very closely this is how you have to provide the stirrup so this is how you have to provide the stirrup very closely very closely in the sense this center to center will be how much 130 mm that is what it is written here 130 mm right so this has to be 130 mm also from here also it has to be 130 mm center to center spacing from here also it has to be 130 center to center spacing it has to be 130 center to center spacing but when you come to the center portion that is from here to here the spacing is 285 so what i try to do i try to increase the spacing so let us say this is my 280 spacing. Now you can see the variation here. This is closely spaced. This is also closely spaced. Whereas in the center, I have increased it to 285 center to center spacing, isn't it? So this is how we have to provide the or in uh, shear uh, shear reinforcement that is the stirrups in this fashion. Now what is the reason behind this? We'll try to see in uh, one more uh, in the in the next. Uh, yeah, we'll try to see that somewhere here. Why such things happens? And also we'll try to see that with the help of ETABs, how the ETABs will generate the result. Uh, yeah, I want to minimize this so that I can explain it. Okay, and other things remains the same. I'm not going to explain the other beams as well. The, cons the other beam, the same thing has happened everywhere. Even here also you can see that. Even here also you can see that everywhere. This is how it's going to happen. Uh, there's no much change. Everywhere they have made use of 12 diameter bar, 12 diameter bar, at three at the top and three at the bottom that is sufficient and also if you relate this example with a residential building there also we made use of 12 and 16 diameter bar but here they felt only 12 diameter three bar is sufficient and you're not giving any extra reinforcement here since it is a hostel building and you don't have any heavy load coming that is the reason you don't have any top extra bar near the support right yeah so we'll try to understand the logic why that uh, stirrups have been closed basically near the support it has been increased and then it has been closely spaced, right? For that, uh, I need to make use of, uh, yeah. So let us say, let us say uh, this is my beam. So actually what happens, we should understand how the shear force variation will happen, right? We, we have to understand how the shear force variation is happening. So this is how my shear force variation, we already seen this. I mean, we, are, we know from the basics of structural analysis and strength of materials, this is how the variation of a stirrup shear force is going to happen near the support. This is my support, right? And this is my support near the support. My shear force is more near the support. My shear force is more. The moment I come, I, I go away from the support. My shear force is linearly varying, linear, varying, varying, and it has come to zero here. Again, from here, it has increasing, 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 and it is reaching to the maximum here. That means can I write here V max, V max stand for V stand for shear. So let us say V max, that is shear force is maximum here, right? Similarly, I'll write here V max. V max stand for shear force is maximum here. But can I, by the time I reach here, can I say that the shear force is zero, right? The shear force is zero here. Now, somewhere here, the shear force is in between. It is neither maximum nor it is minimum somewhere here, 
right let us say this is one point where the shear force is minimum okay it is minimum similarly there is one point somewhere here where the shear force is minimum can i say that yeah here the shear force is not maximum nor it is minimum it is in between so i'll write it as v minimum v minimum and v minimum so here it is zero so why i'm trying to tell see if the shear force is maximum i require more number of stirrups what is shear force i have a beam here so i have a beam here this beam will try to cut in this way because of the force coming see i have this is a beam i have a load coming on this beam so because of the load this beam will try to cut from here near the support okay so this beam will try to cut from the support this is my cup this is my, let us say this is my support yeah i'll make use of this let us say this is a beam what i have and this is a support when the force come the beam will try to cut from here that beam will try to cut from the support so that is why the shear force is maximum near the support that is why we have a shear force maximum here and shear force maximum near the support if the shear force is maximum what is shear force shear force is nothing but it is a uh, force which will try to cut the beam this is my beam okay it will try to cut a beam you take a scissor and you take a paper and a scissor and try to cut so what you are putting you are actually putting a shear force this is how a shear force is going to happen so i have a beam here when the force come my beam will try to cut from where from the support near the support that is why we have more shear force here so this is how my beam is trying to cut if the shear force is more i require more number of stirrup and more number of stirrup can be provided by closely spacing that isn't it what i'm trying to tell is if the shear force is more i require more number of stirrups and more number of stirrups can be provided by placing them at the closer distance now concentrate here 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 the shear force is maximum but if you come 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 down come down come down here the shear force is minimum and here the shear force is almost zero now if the shear force is zero or let us say if the shear force is less then less number of stirrups is required and less number of stirrups can be provided by increasing the spacing isn't it if i if, if my shear force itself is less then number of stirrups or the st stirrups required is less if the stirrup required is less how can a less stirrup can be given by by increasing the spacing i can give less number of stirrup if i am giving less number of stirrup that means the shear force itself is less that is why keeping this in mind that is why we can see that near the support they have given the spacing of a stirrup at 130 center to center spacing 130 center to center spacing 130 center to center spacing i'll write it here so this was my support in the previous uh, example what we saw what they told is you have to provide you have to provide 8 mm bar at 130 center to center support so this was my support again here also it was written you have to provide 8 mm bar at 130 center to center right because the shear force is maximum till here near the support the shear force is also maximum till here near the support but by the time you came to the middle portion this much is my middle portion here the shear force itself is less if the shear force itself is less less number of stirrup is required and less number of stirrup can be can be given by increasing the spacing that is the reason we saw that the, uh, the uh, near the center what happened is you had to provide 8 mm bar itself as a stirrup but that spacing was increased to 285 285 why it has been increased to 285 because shear force itself is less if when shear force itself is less why i'll, I'll why, why unnecessary I'm, why unnecessary i'm going to give more stirrup and increase the cost of the building since the stirrup since the shear force itself was less what i will do is i'll try to increase the spacing between the stirrup if i'm trying to increase the spacing between the stirrup less number of steel is less number of stirrups will be required if less number of stirrups is required then less number of steel is utilized so in that way i'm what i'm trying to do i'm trying to make the structure economical otherwise you can give throughout the same spacing no one is going to stop you otherwise instead of you know increasing it here i'll show one example let us let us come here uh, so that you get a clear picture Uh, if you concentrate here right yeah so what has what has what happened here you can see here it was it, it was telling that throughout the span you have to provide 130 center to center spacing 130 center to center spacing 130 center to center spacing here they nowhere mentioned that near the support it has to be 130 near this support it has to be 130 near the center it has to be 280 um, right even in this way also we can do that but that depends on two things one is that how the e tabs has given you the result how the shear force A value has been generated in the e tab. That is the first reason. Second reason is that 
if you want to make it economical then we try to do in this way and we have to see whether the beam is a uh, you know uh, what you call a, a heavy loaded beam or not all those things should be considered and only then we try to detail in this way whereas here yeah whereas here since it is a very small beam it is no, it, no it, the reason is not about the small beam small beam the reason is that maybe the shear force was more near the support that is why the structure consultant felt that felt that he has to increase the spacing here increase the spacing here i mean uh, he has to decrease the spacing by giving it 130 130 and in the center portion he felt that the shear force itself is less that is why he has increased it to 285 so this is how the variation is going to happen so this how the this is my support this is my support near the support the variation the shear force is maximum near the support the shear force is maximum that is why more number of stirrups is required more number of stirrup is required more number of stirrup can be provided by by placing it at closer spacing whereas in the center less number of stirrup is required less number of stirrup can be provided by increasing the spacing that is the reason i am increasing the spacing near the center right yeah and this distance what you can work out yeah yeah i hope it is understood up to here i'll try to clear everything and this distance what the structure consultant has given this distance what the structure consultant has given i feel what you have to do is you have to divide this span by 3 what i'm trying to tell you this is usually what we do i'll make use of the calculator yeah it should come out yeah what you have to do is whatever is your span whatever is a span what is the span here from this support to this support it is 2630 right so 2630 divided by 3 why it has to be divided by 3 because this is my one zone this is my second zone and this is my third zone so that uh, particular beam is divided into uh, three zone that is why i'm dividing it by 3 how much i'm getting 876 i'm getting and uh, 876 mm and look at what he has given he has rounded it off to 888 mm he has rounded it off to 880 mm i'm getting 876 here but the structure consultant has uh, rounded off it to 880 and he has rounded off it to 880 880 so 880 and 880 are going to give here and whatever is remaining what is remaining again it's a simple mathematics 2630 2630 is distance from this face to this face you have to deduct 880 880 of this side and deduct another 880 from this side how much is left out 870 is what you are getting so this 870 i have to give this spacing uh, you know uh, this whatever inside spacing i am getting that is only 880 mm yeah, sorry that is only 870 mm this is 880 and this is 880 if you want to cross verify then try to add 870 plus 880 plus 880 it has to be this distance exactly 2630 i am getting here 2630 is what i am getting here right yeah uh, we'll try to calculate the number of stirrup as well that would be more interesting what i'm trying to tell is see he has given up to 880 mm you have to provide two legged 8 mm stirrup at 130 center to center spacing if this is a thing what is mentioned we'll try to see how many number of stirrups are going to come see generally this things has a site engineer we need to do at the site all these things will not be mentioned in the structural drawing that how many number of stirrup is going to come anyhow uh, when we take up some bar bending schedule classes we'll try to understand them but as of now we can do a rough calculation what is mentioned here from this support to here 880 mm is written so 880 divided by what is the spacing between two stirrup it is 130 right i'll divide it by 130 how much i'm getting 6.76 means it is 7 seven, uh, seven. we have to add one more to that since uh, we are calculating the spacing but we need number of bars what we have to do is 6.76 can be treated as 7 you cannot put 6.75 stir up you have to round off it to the next figure next higher value so 6.76 the next higher value is 7 for that we need to add one more so it comes out to be 8 so i need to provide Eight stir up here. Again, this is eight eighty here. Again, I need to provide eight stir up here. So from here, I'm going to provide eight stir up at one thirty center to center spacing. From here, I'm going to provide eight stir up at one thirty center to center spacing. And what about the center portion? Center portion, this distance, what we got is eight seventy, right? Eight seventy. This has to be divided by what is the spacing given? Two eighty five. Hardly three or four might come in between. That's it. Yeah. 3.0 you can consider this to be 3 only 3 itself so here you don't have to add another because already you are going to add here already you are going to add here so when you are calculating for the center portion you don't have to add another stirrup okay so whatever you are getting you have to round it off 
you are getting three here. So in the center, I'm going to add only three stirrup. So I'm going to add only three stirrup in this way. I'm going to add only three stirrup. This is one. This is second my, this is second stirrup. And this is my third stirrup. And the spacing between these three stirrup is 285, 285, 285 and 285 center to center spacing. Right. So this is how we try to calculate the uh, reinforcement. Uh, this is how we try to understand the beam reinforcement. This is how we try to understand the shear forces. And this is how we try to calculate the number of stirrup that is required once we start to do the execution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So other than that, I don't feel there is any other things left out to explain here. Almost all things have been covered here. And the rest all remains the same. Here they have made use of 16 diameter 2 bar at the top, 12 diameter 3 bar at the top. And then again, they have made use of 2 leg, 2 leg 8mm, 130 center to center spacing, 130 center to center spacing. Right? So this was all about the plinth beam layout. And uh, it was all about how to understand the uh, plinth beam uh, reinforcement details. I hope you are able to understand this. Uh, and we'll see you back in the next lecture. Thank you.